Okay, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to our concurrent meeting of the Committees for Economy, Infrastructure and Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. And um, Peter has told me that the, this is a first, apparently, to have three committees Thanks together, so, so. Um, it's an, an interesting one. Um, so just to highlight, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via Starleaf, and our witnesses for today's briefing will also attend via Starleaf. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. So just to, to remind members to mute their tablet devices when they aren't speaking. So this meeting is taking place under Standing Order 64B of the Assembly Standing Orders, which allows for committees to sit concurrently to consider matters of joint concern. As this will be a single briefing, much of the standing order does not apply. However, as agreed by the three committees, I will act as, as the chair of the sitting with the Infrastructure Committee Chairperson Michelle McElveen and the Deputy Chairperson of the ERA Committee Philip McGuigan acting as the deputies. As per Standing Order 64B, quorum for the concurrent sitting is reached when there is a quorum present for each of the committees and we are yeah, satisfied that there is the quorum requirement met. So just moving on then to item number one which is apologies. We have received apologies from Gordon Dunn Declan McAleer, David Hilditch um, and Martina Anderson, so unless there's any additional ones that have come in since then. Okay, thank, you. thank you. So moving on then to item number two, which is our briefing this morning from Fujitsu and HMRC regarding the Trader Support Service. So there is a clerk's memo at page three of the meeting pack and a briefing paper from TSS at page 10 in the meeting pack. There is correspondence from Logistics UK MI Director at page 13 of the meeting pack. And there is, as members will be aware, um, limited enough time this morning, so we'll go straight into the briefing. And I'd like to bring into the spotlight, and they're already in the spotlight, thank you, Christian Benson from Fujitsu of TSS, Mary Scullion, Fujitsu TSS, Aidan Riley from HMRC and Julie Etheridge, HMRC. So if I hand over to yourselves to make an opening statement and then we can get into the discussion. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much and, and good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, if, if it's OK, I will uh, share my screen. Uh, uh, a, a quick briefing uh, on, on TFS. Uh, I'll try and keep this brief because I'm aware, obviously, that members would like to ask questions. Um, so hopefully um, everybody can see my screen. Christian, we're, we're not seeing slides. Right. Okay, let me try again. Can you see this? We're good now, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, I'm Christian Benson, uh, Plant Managing Director uh, for uh, HMRC within Fujitsu and the Senior Responsible Owner for the Trader Support Service. I'm joined by Mary Scullion, Head of Delivery for the Trader Support Service from Fujitsu, uh, Julie Atridge, uh, Delivery Director for HMRC and the SRO for the Trader Support Service, and Aidan Wiley, Board of in HMRC. Um, uh, so just a, a quick background on TSS, uh, it was set up at pace, uh, built and rolled out uh, in three months, uh, all, all of that uh, obviously under COVID restrictions. Um, the procurement process began in August and the contract was awarded to the TSS consortium in mid-September. The consortium includes uh, Fujitsu as Prime, McKinsey, uh, Iori UK, the Institute for Export and International Trade and HGS, or Hinduja Global Systems. Um, the programme was launched on the 28th of September, uh, so very shortly after contracts awarded with the, the go-live of the uh, Northern Ireland Customs and Trade Academy website, uh, providing education. There are over a 1,000 people working on the programme to deliver TSS. Um, in terms of preparedness and education, uh, this has been a, a very large part of the service that we have provided we continue to provide. Uh, so we have hosted over 150 engagements so far uh, with businesses and trade on one basis uh, and in addition um, over 75 seminars reaching approximately 3,500 organisations and individuals. Uh, and you can see in front of you uh, a selection of 
organizations that we have engaged with um, and, and just uh, out, out of interest we are engaged with or have engaged with uh, ACETA, um, with uh, the Belfast City Council, uh, with the British Retail Consortium NI and UK, and with the International Meat Traders Association. Uh, on our um, uh, education website, um, the uh, NI Customers and Trade Academy, we have over 30 user, user guides. Um, and those user guides have been downloaded over 330,000 times uh, since going live at the end of September. The service itself, um, so it is a free to use digital service helping businesses and traders of all sizes to navigate the changes to the way goods move uh, once the Northern Ireland Protocol came into effect on the 1st of January. So we offer education and advice. Uh, we provide a digital first service, which means uh, mainly web, website driven, uh, but we also provide a, a contact center and contact center support to help traders with issue resolution on the new mandatory process. Uh, we don't uh, provide a personalized um, intermediary uh, service uh, that is uh, typically offered by custom brokerages. So we don't offer commercial advice, although we do offer tailored and very specific advice on how to use the process. Um, we don't replace the services offered by the existing intermediary market or uh, nor do we raise non-standard documentation. So, for example, health certificates and other uh, licenses are uh, very much focused on uh, the HMRC customs process. So we do offer advice across the full range of uh, customs, um, customs processes that need to be followed by, by traders. Um, the, the process itself uh, is illustrated on this slide. Uh, we have uh, made every effort to, to simplify uh, this process as, as far as possible. Uh, so it consists of one-off registration. So the traders register uh, with the service on the platform. And so far, over 36,000 uh, traders have done that. Uh, they submit the shipment, shipment information to TSS. We provide the carrier with an entry summary declaration and automatically process a simplified frontier declaration on behalf of the trader. Uh, we interface with HMRC systems who provide the approval to move, uh, the shipment arrives, and then the trader provides additional shipment information to complete the supplementary declaration. Uh, the trader also uh, needs to maintain evidence and pay duties um, uh, as, as required by HMRC. So as I said, we now have over 36,000 registered, registered traders. That was against uh, original estimates of 24,000, so far more than we originally anticipated. Uh, and of those traders, 43% uh, uh, are based in Northern Ireland, 2% in Ireland, and 55% uh, Great Britain. And, and since uh, the 1st of January, we've seen a rise of over 30% in those registrations. Uh, providing evidence that the market thinks that TSS is working and is responding. Staffing and operations, we have over a thousand people working on both the program and the life service. Uh, the contact centre, we have uh, 750 agents manning the desks between 7.30 in the morning and 10.30 at night, uh, seven days a week. Um, we operate a triage system, so we have uh, three tiers of agents. The tier one agents deal with incoming calls uh, and simple uh, simple requests such as password resets. The tier two agents uh, make up the majority of the agents in the call center. They typically have uh, over two years of um, customs experience and they deal with the, the more detailed case, cases. Uh, tier three agents uh, typically with seven or more years of customs experience. Um, take a, a deal with the more complex cases and take a very hands-on and personalized approach uh, with traders to help them solve their problems. Uh, we are constantly upskilling our agent base uh, with uh, weekly training and knowledge sharing between all those three tiers of agents. In terms of metrics, um, you can see some numbers there on, on, on the left-hand side. Um, so, uh, we offer the free support and advice to traders in, in managing legally required customs uh, declarations. 
uh, TSS has so far processed uh, and enabled uh, the movement of over 330,000 consignments since the 1st of January. It is a digital first service, so it's over 90% of queries are raised online. Um, and we see TSS users actively engaging with, with the training uh, and the training materials. So um, nearly 200,000 visits to the uh, NICTA Academy and over 300,000 training guides uh, downloaded. Um, TSS is an evolving service. So um, we, we, we started uh, with a process that would enable uh, the, the facilitation of the movement of the maximum number of goods uh, serving all traders. So, so we started with uh, the most simplified and commonly used process, um, but over time this service is evolving. Uh, we've worked hard to train our agents more extensively. Um, and as I said, uh, weekly training sessions occurring with all those contact center agents. Um, we're constantly educating the trader community. Uh, I talked previously about the one-to-one -one -to -one engagements and also the, the seminars that we hold. Uh, those seminars typically uh, are hosted by both TSS representatives plus HMRC, uh, plus uh, DEFRA and, and, and DERA representation as well. Um, it's important to say that we are not complacent. We, we recognize there is still work to do and we continue to work on releasing more functionality and enhance our service uh, to support the trading communities of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, identify and apply UCC facilitations uh, to help re reduce the administrative requirements, particularly for small traders. Um, uh, some examples here of how we have uh, responded to the market. Um, so SPS uh, groupage, so TSS was instrumental in securing an easement for traders. Moving SPS groupage loads and it in particular catches of fish which are enabled to move from Scotland to Northern Ireland. Uh, we worked alongside HMRC uh, and other government agencies uh, to, to simplify that process. This was done actually over New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, uh, where we uh, engaged with our, our, our senior trade advisor, Shankar Singham, to enable that to happen. Uh, we have also responded to Paulius, uh, who told us that uh, service wasn't uh, wasn't probably serving their, their needs. Uh, so so uh, we very quickly uh, created uh, a new system uh, to, to more closely model the business model of all years, which is known as consignment from first, allows consignment data to be entered separately in advance to the vehicle details. Uh, and finally, the transit service that we set up has been very well received uh, in the market also. And you can see a quote there from Hans Marsen, uh, former head of the Dutch Customs Brokers. Association. Uh, in terms of user experience, uh, we've helped uh, businesses of all sizes, uh, all sizes adapt to the new requirements and continue to trade. Uh, you can see some examples in front of you from Tata Steel, uh, what are needing to move 200 tons of steel, uh, the major energy and electricity provider into Northern Ireland. Um, so we, we, we stood up uh, some agents to help specifically uh, process the paperwork and, and they do this now on a, an ongoing monthly basis. Uh, and then also uh, some, some other examples of, of smaller uh, businesses uh, that we're helping and we've received very positive feedback from those businesses. Um, and, and, and finally, uh, just some, some quotes from the Federation, Roger Pollan, uh, the Federation of Small Businesses, um, talk, talking about the uh, TSS being extraordinarily helpful um, and really helping uh, individual businesses to facilitate goods movement um, uh, as, as well as we can and very cooperative. And uh, that is the end of my briefing. Uh, I just wanted to finish by saying I'm, I'm incredibly proud actually of the service that the TSS consortium has managed to stand up in a very short space of time. And we continue to evolve, as I say, and help businesses um, and, and help facilitate the movement of goods between GB and North America. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, um, Christian. So just uh, to highlight to members, 
during the, the question and answer session. Now, questions will rotate around the committees as follows Economy, Infrastructure, ERA, and then around again and again. Questions will continue until there are no further questions to be asked or until the briefing ends at 12 pm. Um, and as always, questions will be asked through the chair. Myself and the deputy chair will identify the members to ask the questions. And the member will then be brought into the spotlight if they're using Starleaf, where they can ask their question. And once they've asked their question, they'll be returned to the audience. Each committee has determined the order in which members will be called. And just to ensure the maximum number of members get to ask a question, members shouldn't uh, make any long preambles or statements before their questions, and there won't be an opportunity to ask an immediate supplementary following your initial question. So I, I'm going to open up first of all, and thanks very much, Christian, for the briefing. I thought it was very helpful. Um, and as you highlighted yourself, it's, it's an evolving service, um, and obviously the lateness of the, the agreement around how the protocol would operate and the trade and cooperation agreement itself um, obviously impacted on, on how how a TSS origin or initially operated, um, and to just to give some feedback, at the beginning of the year there was widespread reports from media and constituents that TSS wasn't functioning particularly well, and that there was some inconsistent and incorrect information being um, given initially. And I was just wanting to get your feedback on that, and if that is actually correct, is that a correct reflection? Um, and what has been learnt since the beginning of January, and what has been done to be um, more responsive to the needs of businesses? And you mentioned specifically that you don't provide bespoke information, but is there um, further work being done to perhaps be able to be that bit more responsive to individual businesses? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So, so yes, um, as 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 when, when the service was were, was stood up, um, obviously we were um, we were very conscious of, of of the need to serve businesses who who haven't had to do this before, um, and uh, despite well, we, we trained our contact centre agents. Uh, all the way, well, since they were recruited and all the way through the, the back end of uh, last year. Um, we continue to improve uh, that, that training. Um, we continue to provide uh, training on a weekly basis, as I said, to all of those agents. And, and what we see actually uh, is, is a gradual improvement uh, in, the, in, in, in the way that those calls are being answered and, and that businesses are, are being served. Um, so, so I'm confident that that actually, with the training in place, with the experience we've now gained, and with the triage and and system we have in place, and the different tiers of agents, uh, that that we you know, we have a gradually improving service, uh, and more and more uh, experienced users are providing, uh, yeah, providing a better service to traders. Um, to to your question around uh, the personalised service, so. So yes, we don't offer a commercial service as um, as, as you know, typical customs agents or intermediaries would, um, but we do actually. Uh, we call we call traders where we see they are having problems. Uh, we provide uh, through our tier three agents very sector specific advice as well, uh, and we have um, we have various examples of. of businesses um, providing very positive feedback on, on the service they're providing. And we're also proactively reaching out and calling um, calling businesses. So on Tuesday, uh, for example, we made from the contact centre over 10,000 outbound calls uh, to registered businesses uh, to help them through the process where we, where we thought that they, that they may be stuck or they, they needed assistance. So we're proactively reaching out, as well as uh, taking those calls uh, into the contact centre. I think, is it Mary? Mary, if I may, I'd like to build on some of the points that Christian has made. In terms of the of the training of the various tiers of the agents, as Christian has said, we're constantly evolving that training and, and um, uh, improving on it. But what, what we have built in is a, is a complete feedback loop, if you like. So we have a stakeholder engagement team that operate with the, the uh, trade associations that 
trade question has mentioned, one-to-one -one with specific businesses who need uh, specific advice about how they get through the process. Uh, but in those engagements, uh, what we do is we collect the feedback we have, we identify common problems, and we are evolving our training on that basis. So we've developed over uh, 750 knowledge articles for our contact center agents based on those engagements that help them to uh, answer the, the, the questions that we know are, are exist out there in the marketplace. So we have a complete feedback loop, if you like, in trying to develop that training and to improve um, you know, our, our market engagement gives us the insight into what traders are facing. And that's what we're using to build our training and our knowledge articles for our contact centre. Thank you very much. Um, and I suppose just to reflect that we, we have had feedback that um, that you are very willing to listen to feedback, so that that's that's useful as well. So thank you for that response. Um, Michelle, if I hand over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for the presentations. And obviously, addressing the committee today, and I suppose we're all conscious of the negative impact of the protocol. And certainly, my party's been very clear in its opposition to it. And obviously, we're looking to work to try to to replace that. I very much appreciate the systems that were set up at PACE and obviously they're evolving and it's about trying to educate um, businesses on, 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 on both sides of the IRC in relation to how they need to address that. But I suppose specifically, um, I, I'm conscious that um, there have been, there's been a lack of understanding, I suppose, on the mainland um, about the sending, particularly of the likes of small packages um, to, to Northern Ireland. So it's about what work is being done in order to, to educate businesses on, um, on the mainland. But um, also, there have been issues for, particularly for the Northern Ireland hauliers, um, who have, as a consequence of the protocol, have to transport empty trailers um, from um, mainland GP, GB at great um, expense to themselves. So it's really to understand whether or not um, you're looking at a support package um, for those particular um, hauliers? Um, we, we are aware um, uh, and we do speak to the Road Haulage Association and, uh, and other trade bodies. We are aware of the difficulties they faced and our response on the consignment first solution that Christian referred to in his presentation was in, in answer to that. Uh, the, the kinds of issues that the, the, the trolliers were bringing to our attention. Uh, and it was very much based around the fact that um, they're putting together details of their consignment way before they know exactly which lorry is going to take or which vehicle is going to take those consignments um, on the journey uh, from GB to NI. Um, so uh, that consignment first allowed them to put together those details and at the last minute as their business model is to uh, allocate those to a particular vehicle. Uh, and that was exceptionally well received. Uh, as an example of the feedback that we are sorry of how we've used that feedback to evolve and develop those systems. And we have a rolling program of releases for the system. So we listen to feedback in conjunction with HMRC colleagues and others. Um, we identify where we might have improvements. So our rolling program is, is identifying what's going to be the most effective changes we can make. Um, we agree a release program for those and communicate accordingly. In your question around the preparedness, of whether it's NI or GB, um, interestingly, our analysis of the 36,000 traders that are that are registered with us, 55% of those are based in GB, and it's through that outreach that we have with those traders and with the various associations that we're trying to do um, more and more outreach to make more and more businesses aware and prepared for what is ahead of them. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could just ask the, the witnesses when you aren't speaking, if you could mute your devices as well, because um, the members in the in the Starley for, are getting a little bit of feedback. So, um, Philip, and, and, oh, and also some members, if you haven't muted, if you could do so as well. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, which has been very, very useful. Uh, in terms of just kind of following on some of the, the issues discussed. Uh, Regarding the groupage solution that you, you've talked about there, uh, containment first. I mean, can I ask, uh, was this done in tandem with Dira, who had previously mentioned at our committee they were working on, on similar schemes? And then, following on from that, more generally speaking, in terms of evolving, enhancing the service that you've talked about, what interactions or what level of interactions are you having with Dira and Defra generally in coordinating checks 
and documentation relating to agri-food and SPS, and then just you know how are you working around the uncertainty of I suppose the British government's uh, unilateral extension uh, period moves as well. Um, in terms of our interaction with uh, DERA uh, uh, and others, um, we are we do have regular engagements, weekly engagements with HMRC colleagues, with DERA, and indeed um, uh, DERA DEFRA uh, join our daily calls just after we do uh, uh, releases. So we are working very closely, um, facilitated through HMRC colleagues with the, the departments that we need to. We're very conscious that TSS is a small cog in a very big machinery. Uh, but and having said that, uh, because these things are so interlinked, we have to make sure that we are linked up completely. So we do have those regular engagements, uh, and we, well, I think we have all of the right contacts in the various organisations to allow us to resolve issues that are brought to us and to proactively engage in any new releases that we do. Um, in terms of. Uh, some of the examples that were given, uh, I think Christian gave the example of the, the groupage for, for fish. Um, uh, early on in the process, we are trying as far as possible to work with colleagues to identify where uh, easements uh, help uh, and work those through where, where we can to make suggestions to improve the lot um, of, of uh, uh, the companies that, and organisations that we engage with. We're very much about implementing the rules uh, and um, trying to, to smooth the, the, the path of, of, of what uh, uh, um, the rules tell us we need to, to, to apply. Um, uh, so, but at the same time, um, we have, as we've proven um, here, are some of the examples that we've given, we have actually made suggestions and worked with other organisations to uh, identify where simple can help. And um, it's, it's worth pointing out that the member also raised um, how we deal with uh, uncertainty um, given, the, well, given the, 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 the status of negotiations and ongoing changes. So we work very, very closely with, with HMRC colleagues, including Julie and Aidan, on this call to understand as early as possible uh, what might be coming on down the track and then obviously make, make uh, relevant modifications. Uh, to us, to our systems and processes, to to, to allow for those changes to happen, um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm really proud of the, the track record so far in, in us being able to modify those those systems and those processes uh, to allow for those changes. Okay, okay thank you. So can I bring into the spotlight, please, Stuart Dixon? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank everybody for the uh, presentation which we've had so far. Um, may I ask you, as we approach the end or change of the grace periods, uh, and also as the pandemic uh, starts perhaps to ease a little across the UK, we will see a great deal more uh, business and, and transportation taking place. Uh, how are you resourced to tackle that? Because clearly there will be a large change either uh, as a result of the ending or changing of grace periods uh, and also as a result of an increased uh, volume of traffic and goods uh, in the systems. Thank you, Chair. As, as Christian has already alluded to, we have a, we have about a thousand people working on this. We have seven hundred and fifty agents, uh, and based on on the analysis that we are doing to date, I mean our calls are answered within around six seconds on average, um, and uh, we uh, have processed, as Christian said, supported three hundred and thirty odd thousand uh, consignments moving. Um, we believe that we uh, are in a position. We've seen all sorts of humps there. Every time we new, do a new release or every time uh, uh, a new uh, process has to be followed, for example, in recent times we've, we've um, um, made live the supplementary declaration process. So we do see peaks and troughs, but even at that, we are still uh, well able uh, to um, respond uh, actively respond and quickly respond to the requests that we have to the extent that, I mean, we have been able to do 38,000 odd outbound calls in addition to processing the 30,000 inbound calls. It is important to make the point that um, it is a digital first service. So a huge proportion of the uh, movements that happen through the TSS system are actually generated by traders uh, 
uh, electronically and move through the system without intervention. So it's not that we actually have to hands-on process everything that goes through the system. Our, our hands-on activity is around identifying perhaps where some traders seem to be having problems and contacting them, doing the outbound calling, uh, and uh, also then responding to the queries that come into us either digitally or uh, by telephone. But a huge because it's a digital first, because it's the service that we're providing the processing declarations and so on 24 7 because of that with the evidence that we see for how we're able to respond so far we believe that we have the resources in place to deal with any um upload in the volumes uh, obviously we size to millions of declarations we're not seeing those yet uh, but we believe we're well placed to actually cover them all and uh, whenever we do see those picks okay. thank you um michelle uh Keith Buchanan. Can we bring Keith into the spotlight? Okay, can you hear me okay, yeah? Okay, thank you, um, Mary and Christian, for your information so far. My question relates to your 36,000 registered businesses, 43% uh, of you referred to Northern Ireland, 2% Norway, and 50 for 5% in GB. What do you envisage that number needing to be? To, when obviously, when it was, as Mr. Dixon referred to earlier, whenever the lockdown opens up, that's going to increase, obviously, back and forth. What do you envisage that 36,000 registered numbers needing to be that everybody, therefore, that always stood on north, south, or sorry, east, west, west, east transfer is on the service and using the service? So, um, as, as, as I uh, mentioned earlier, um, we originally envisaged, uh, based on projections from, from HMRC, that uh, we'd have around 24,000 uh, businesses registering with TSS. Uh, in actual fact, as we said, we, we have 36,000, and uh, a significant number of those have registered since uh, the beginning of the beginning of the year. Um, so, so it, it is difficult to say with, with any confidence uh, how many more uh, are likely to need to register. Uh, but I would hope that we have the vast majority of, uh, of businesses uh, who need to register already registered on, on, on the system. Uh, and, and that has been, you know, that, that, that level of registrations has been achieved with uh, a significant amount of um, education, outreach and, and publicity um, that, 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 that's been done by TSS and by HMRC uh, and by the government. And, and uh, you will have seen uh, various uh, TV campaigns and social media outreach. Uh, we use LinkedIn, uh, Facebook um, to, to reach as many traders uh, as possible. Um, and, and towards the end of last year, uh, we, we did a, a very focused uh, campaign uh, to reach out uh, proactively to um, all traders that, that we knew uh, were conducting business with GB and Northern Ireland. And, and we saw a significant uptick in the number of registrations based on that outbound calling. Um, so yeah, uh, as I said, it's really difficult to say, uh, but I, I, I would have confidence that we have, uh, we have reached um, uh, the majority of traders looking to move goods. Okay, thank you. What? William Irwin. Can we bring William Irwin into the spotlight, please? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to thank Mary and, and Christian for their presentation. Uh, on the outset, uh, make it clear that as a party, uh, we want to support the protocol and want to see it replaced. Uh, given the, and it has been touched on by a previous uh, speaker, given that the current uh, grace period, uh, there are difficulties, and I have some businesses complaining about supplementary uh, declarations, but given that the grace period is coming, stage will end. Um, we have been told by our chief that in Northern Ireland that the declarations will increase tenfold to possibly up to 30,000 per day. Uh, and it, it is a bit, it certainly from Northern Ireland's point of view, this will be, I think, undoable. But I want to ask, how do you see the protocol being delivered uh, when, when the grace period ends and this massive Tenfold increase in, in declarations uh, coming to play uh, into force. 
I, I, um, as, as far as we are concerned, our projections for numbers and so on would allow us to process the declarations that we we anticipate. I, I think it is it, it, it's worth saying that uh, in terms of you mentioned supplementary declarations and supplementary declarations being difficult, um, we we uh, certainly our, our biggest focus collectively PSS with the HMRC colleagues. Our focus is, has been on keeping goods moved, moving, and that's why we separated out the goods moving movement from the, what is the slightly more complex process for supplementary declarations once they've arrived, uh, and we will continue jointly to have that focus on keeping goods moving. Uh, I, I think it's worth just adding in, we didn't mention that whilst we are a service that uh, operates in terms of our call centre from 7.30 to 10.30 in the evening, uh, we can't de process declarations electronically 24 hours a day, but we also offer a kind of stuck at port service um, out of ours that is actually making sure that those goods do keep moving. So there is a, a, a sense, there was a, a rationale in separating out the goods moving from the declarations that are, are slightly more complex in terms of, of uh, having to apply the rules and so on with supplementary declarations. Um, so, but our projections are that we will be able to deal with uh, the volume of all the uh, movements and declarations that are required um, as uh, um, time evolves and as um, grace periods and so on finish. Hey, can I just uh, you know, make one point to Satan Riley here, I'm the Director of uh, Customs and Border Design in HMRC, just on the grace I think the member was referencing the the uh, agree uh, kind of check grace periods. Uh, they don't have a, a direct impact on the amount of declarations that uh, traders need to make for the customs purposes. Uh, although there might be kind of extra data fields that, that need, needed on those declarations, depending upon uh, what the kind of the final uh, situation is with regard to those uh, those checks. So just to be clear, the, the declaration numbers. Uh, in respect to uh, customs should uh, continue uh, as is you know, wherever we end up getting to with regard to the, uh, the, the final kind of position with regard to agri checks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we bring Gary Middleton into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair, and uh, obviously thanks for the presentation, uh, very useful information. Uh, like others, I want to say just on the record that uh, obviously we do not support the protocol and want to see uh, the protocol replaced. Um, obviously, uh, in GB uh, particularly, there has been a lot of confusion around uh, customs declarations and, and career requirements, and you know, various GB businesses have taken the decision not to deliver goods to Northern Ireland. Uh, what I would like to find out, do you have any figures for um, those who have contacted the TSS service and have just felt that, look, the burdens were too much, the complexities were too much, that they decided not to bother uh, and, and not to service the Northern Ireland public? Thank you. We wouldn't ha have specific stats on those that have taken those decisions. Our job is very much to support people through the process, and, and uh, we have provided some feedback or some of the examples of feedback that we've had where we have been able to ease that process. Um, my husband is a small trader himself, uh, and um, obviously, uh, like every other small trader in Northern Ireland, he has been worried about what he, he how he might import his goods and how his suppliers might react um, and so far uh, he has used the trader service trader support service very effectively to work with his suppliers in GB to uh, bring goods into Northern Ireland for his business uh, I'm not quite sure in my own mind how he would have done that without the help of the likes of the trader support service so we do very much feel that our of is about making it easier and simpler for um, businesses to make to move those goods from GB to Northern Ireland, um, both from the perspective of the uh, trader in GB who's supplying the goods and businesses like my husband's in Northern Ireland who are trying to bring the goods in. 
uh, and, and uh, as we've said, in terms of the number of movements that we've made, we have eased uh, the path for many, many people in, in trying to, to, to make it as simple as, as it possibly can be. And as we've described, we've evolved that over time. Uh, so, um, you know, we will continue to, to, to do that. Uh, we will continue to, although we don't provide, provide a bespoke solution for every organization, we will provide, um, I'll call it bespoke advice, but we will actually help individual traders through the journey. Uh, so in so much as they uh, um, are in touch with us and we help them, uh, we would not have statistics around anyone who has made a decision not to use, not to, to supply goods to Northern Ireland. That, that's not something we have specific visibility of. Okay, thank you. Michelle? Cahill Borlam. Can we bring Cahill into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentation. Just Aidan, um, you said in one of your slides this is a six-stage process from registration through. Just to quickly, the time frame on that. I also, um, following on from a previous question, the issue of the potentially increase in numbers. Um, you're up to 36,000 now. Is TSS ready for the additional increase if there's an increase? And finally, the question of engagement. Obviously, I represent a border constituency. Um, so, the, from, from my perspective, sorry, sorry, the phone's ringing there in the background. From my perspective, what engagement has there been in terms of those businesses, especially in the border the corridors where they're registered both north and south because of Brexit, they actually have an operating centre in, in the south. So, in terms of proper engagement and facilitating those businesses who primarily are operating uh, from the north, has there been extra, any extra engagement or advice in relation to? helping their transition through. Those are my three main points. Thank you. So, um, so I, 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 I'm sorry, you, you broke up at, at the beginning, so I'm not sure I caught all of your questions. But I, I think you were talking about the length of time it takes to... to yes, I said, yeah, there's a six-stage process from register. Yeah, there's roughly the time frame for that first, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so um, on average, uh, we, we're finding that so we're able to process uh, around 80% of declarations within 15 minutes. Um, of those, the vast majority actually flow through uh, in seconds uh, to, to the back to the HMRC systems, and, that, and then we get a, a response back from those HMRC systems. Uh, the end-to-end -end process includes uh, supplementary declarations, and the supplementary declarations are raised uh, after the goods have moved. Uh, so, so, so we. That, that, that obviously dictates the, the length of the, the end to end process. Uh, but, but in terms of actually processing the declarations, as I said, the vast majority are, are, are handled uh, in seconds. Um, as to the, uh, the, the increase in numbers and volumes, um, I'll go, go back to uh, Mary's point. So, so we're very confident that we are resourced within the contact centre uh, to deal with uh, the increase in volumes that, that, that we anticipate. Uh, and also the, the, the technology solution uh, that we've provided is also uh, sized appropriately uh, to deal with uh, to deal with lar large numbers of large, large, large volumes of declarations. So in excess of, of what we're doing now, we're very confident uh, that that will continue to be the case. And, and, and so far, the system has been available 100% of the time. So. It hasn't gone down uh, since January the 1st at all, no outages, uh, and we're confident that that will continue to be the case. Um, as to your point around engagement with businesses uh, both north and south of, uh, of the border, obviously our focus has been on engaging with Northern Ireland businesses and GB businesses, uh, moving goods uh, east to west um, uh, and, and vice versa. Um, however, we are engaged very closely with the, um, with the Irish government as well and the different departments and agencies within the Irish government. So, so we hold uh, regular calls uh, with, the, um, with the Irish Revenue Service, with the I Irish Agriculture Department as, uh, as well. Uh, and we, we are closely linked to what they're doing uh, with their own systems uh, as well to make sure that uh, that north-south trade is facilitated as far as possible. 
Thank you, Philip. Absolutely. Can we bring Patsy McGlone into the spotlight, please? Okay, thanks very much, and, and thank you to, to everyone who has attended and facilitated this meeting with us this morning. Um, to get back to the issue, and it's probably more a question for yourself, Aidan, there at HMRC, um, it's in relation to the supplementary declarations, and uh, many businesses have already made those supplementary declarations, and they're flagging up quite high notional terror uh, in the event. So what, what I'm trying to get is a handle on, we're all into new territory, uh, I want to get a handle on how HMRC is working with those businesses to assure the proper application of the, the appropriate waivers and to minimise and in fact maybe zero ways any tax, any liabilities that would, would ensue as a result. Th thank you very much. So you make a, a very good point. There's a number of different routes uh, to kind of uh, uh, avoiding tariffs on, on goods in the GVNI movement. As you mentioned, there's a way of a scheme for small uh, kind of uh, de minimis uh, amounts under 200,000 uh, over three year movements can, can uh, look at the de minimis stage aid waiver scheme. There's the UK trader scheme where traders can declare their goods not at risk, or there is also if they uh, meet the rules of origin requirements under the, the trade agreement. So, what we are really uh, looking to do, working with TSA, is to try and make sure the traders understand those choices and uh, are directed as far as possible to what looks like the best choice for their circumstances. And uh, TSS are looking to make, and I'm sure uh, colleagues will come in on this in a second, uh, kind of improvements the portal to make sure that uh, traders are uh, don't uh, kind of uh, inadvertently miss the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to make that uh, the right claim when they're actually uh, completing their supplementary declarations through the process. So we're looking to kind of make sure we can target uh, those traders who uh, with the best choice available to them and uh, make sure through the TSS process that they, they, they do make those choices to ensure they don't uh, pay tariffs where, where they shouldn't do so. Thank you. And I don't know whether uh, Mary or, or Christian wants to come in on that on the TSS end. I, I think I mean I, th I think the pack includes if it doesn't I mean I can describe it but there are examples of where we've actually talked and helped uh, organisations through that very process. I mean Alliance Flooring uh, Distribution uh, um, at one point in the uh, can't remember whether it was early on in the process or more recently um, they wanted to make sure that they were able to avail of any zero tariff uh, tariffs that were available to them under the the, the trade agreement. Um, and we were able to work through them to make sure that uh, you know they they were able to use preferential duty codes that uh, uh, ensured that they didn't incur tariffs. Um, so Alliance Flooring is just one example of where we actually coached and talked organisations through and making sure that they were able to avail of what was available to them, whether it's a waiver or a uh, preferential duty code or whatever it might be. Things we've encouraged people to use the UK Trader Scheme, where they can declare their goods. Uh, not at risk uh, to e further ease the process that they have. So we're, we're trying to work as closely as we can with our organisations to do that. And I suppose that's what I mean when I talk about bespoke advice as opposed to bespoke solutions, where we actually do work with those organisations to try and see what's best for them, to help them work out what's best for them. And I, th I think it's also worth pointing out that we, we are, as I said earlier, it is an evolving, um, a, an evolving service, and we're continuing to evolve on the technology side as well uh, to ensure that the portal is as easy to use as possible. Uh, to ensure that we we build advice into the portal so that when uh, traders are entering different types of information, that they're, they're guided as to the type of information that needs to be entered. Uh, and we're looking at ways to, to, to simplify that supplementary declaration process further uh, so, so, so the traders uh, only need, uh, are only asked to enter the data they need to uh, based on the type of, uh, the type of goods that they're using. And so that, that's, that's some, of that, some examples of the um, evolution from the technology perspective as well that we're continuing to, uh, we're continuing to implement. Thank you. Can we bring Claire Sugden into the spotlight, please? Sorry. 
Sorry, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, is there um, some mechanism which would be able to capture or support um, new businesses, um, you know, who maybe haven't yet traded uh, east, west, west, east, um, but are exploring their options um, and, and are wanting to access your service to, to know what that looks like and if there's an opportunity there? Um, without a doubt, uh, we encourage a, a, a anyone who has queries to register with us as a service. Registering with us uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do all your declarations through us, but by registering with us, you have access to all of the materials. Um, the Northern Ireland Customs Training Academy uh, um, have produced a lot of our materials and have extensive experience in this area. And the 330,000 downloads that Christian referred to in his presentation are people doing just that, looking to see um, what is it they need to do, how could they go about things and so on. So registering for the service doesn't isn't necessarily a declaration that says I'm going to use this service. Registering for the service allows that education activity to take place and exploration of what what is this process about? What do I need to know? What do I need to prepare for? Um, so we would encourage people to register for the service uh, so that they have access to all of that material. And clearly they can raise queries with us as well so that we can answer some of the questions that perhaps are unanswered. And, and in uh, doing a lot of work and analysis with our agents, we've had several, um, uh, well, we have a, a wealth of uh, comment back from the agents that would say when so-and-so contacted me, they had read a lot of the training materials and they were able to use them but they had this remaining query that we have now helped them with and um, so uh, the evidence would suggest that a lot of people are finding um, the material uh, very easy to use um, it navigates for them what is obviously a pretty complex area and uh, by its very nature um, but that the materials are helping them to, to, to understand and to navigate through the process. Thank you. Michelle? Roy Beggs. Can we bring Roy Beggs into the spotlight, please? Uh, uh, good morning again. Uh, thanks for your gather a picture and good feedback from yourself. Um, from the outset, again, I would wish to highlight that I consider the Northern Protocol to be a huge burden on trade, East West in particular, uh, and uh, would seek its removal. That being said, I would uh, pass on appreciation for the efforts of the Trading Support uh, Service because I am picking up positive comments from, from, from industry of, for your efforts and trying to overcome some of those burdens. Um, but nevertheless, there are huge burdens remaining. Um, companies are now being asked about the supplementary declarations. That's another level that they're just starting to see. In particular, there's concern about groupage, um, which could have resulted in uh, lorries with 3,000 parcels having to be individually uh, information inputted in, air freight, perhaps 8,000 uh, packages in, in a single cargo, adding considerable costs. Um, and yet I understand there's no facility to upload via spreadsheets, which would improve efficiency for everybody. Uh, again, there's, there's the customer declaration support. Uh, there's no, uh, I understand there's to be a super reduced status set, which hasn't been finalized, hasn't been published, there's no time for training. Um, and then the, the last point I've made about the bureaucracy, so I'm picking up from some companies that they tender internally within their groups for work within the UK. And all these additional bureaucracies are adding to their costs, making them uncompetitive and creating uncertainty on their future. So my question to everyone is, uh, what are they doing to, to really reduce the horrendous level of bureaucracy and additional costs that companies are facing when they move goods, particularly uh, from east to west? Thank you for that. There's two or three parts to that question. Clearly, can I can I address the first one about the uh, uploading? Um, we we uh, are shortly um, uh, uh, releasing our bulk upload for uh, supplementary declarations, which should hopefully address that very first point around. Um, can we not upload? It's not spreadsheets per se, but it is to overcome the problem of having to individually put in every de supplementary declaration singly. Uh, and what, what it is is a mechanism where you can 
bulk upload them uh, and then they are processed singly obviously but uh, it is easing the burden we did this bulk upload whenever we were doing um entry summaries and sfds in the early stages when we went live at first uh, and typically the bulk upload uh, functionality follow shortly on from the uh, portal functionality. So um, the uh, good news is the bulk upload is imminent. The specification for that was published some time ago. I can't remember exactly when, but I think it was mid to late February. Um, so that specification was published some time ago uh, as to how uh, and the how to guide and how to use that bulk upload um, functionality is without a doubt um, a a available on the Nectar website the guide, I mean, and the specification itself. Um, in terms of, of, of the simplification, um, you know, we are driving always to uh, simplify as far as we can. In some cases, as this question has said, it's technology. In some cases, it's working with uh, colleagues to see how we can implement the rules in a different way, say HMRC colleagues and so on, in terms of how we maybe can implement the rules in a, in a slightly different way. Um, I know that the, the, the groupage uh, solution uh, did go some way in the early stages to actually meet do that kind of simplification and we will add those kind of ideas to our what we call our product backload our, our rolling program as we talked about earlier um, so uh, you know we are still constantly working with colleagues to identify um, but, but uh, how we can make it easier um, without a doubt the, there are a set of rules that we have to follow but as I said before we're uh, really focused on actually trying to make that as simple as possible and to support um, all those organizations, as many organizations as we can, through that process. Can I just come in on the, the, the oh, sorry, uh, sorry, apologies, Christian. Can I just come in on the parcels uh, point in specifically? Uh, yeah, so as, as a member will be aware that the government has announced that we're going to extend the kind of the, the uh, Easement period for business and consumer parcels uh, for another uh, kind of six months uh, until uh, we can get to a kind of uh, sensible, kind of uh, pragmatic kind of final solution on the approach uh, with regard to parcels. So we're, we're acutely aware of the need to come, come up with a more proportionate approach to that, and we're, we're obviously going to work with the uh, with the, uh, uh, the EU through Joint Committee uh, to to seek to achieve that. So thank you. Thank you, Aidan. I was also going to point out the, uh, the bulk upload is, is available and is being used for uh, ENS and, and Simplified Frontier uh, declarations. Uh, Mary mentioned the, um, the su supplementary declaration bulk upload will be very shortly available uh, and is currently being tested with, with, with a number of organisations uh, that we know uh, want to use it. So we're working with those organisations to make sure that, that bulk upload is uh, as, uh, as simple to use as possible, uh, and they fully understand it. Uh, and also, uh, I earlier talked about the outreach and, and the one-to-one -one conversations that we have uh, with, with businesses, uh, and, and those businesses do include uh, those task parcel operators, uh, so, so that we, we, we are fully aware of their requirements and, and doing everything we can to, to satisfy those. Uh, so we, we, within the terms of the requirements that we need to offer. Rosemary Barton. Can we bring Rosemary Barton into the spotlight? Um, good morning, and thank you very much for your presentations. Can I also just say that uh, I see the protocol as a total burden, an unnecessary burden, on the transport of goods from Great Britain into Northern Ireland? Um, I have a few questions. It's for H HMRC. And it's in relation to, obviously, uh, HMRC expect of a system in place to provide refunds of tariffs paid where goods remain in Northern Ireland. Have you any idea when this will start? And uh, do you, HMRC, and you, is there any chance of per perhaps introducing a simplified tariff pay system uh, apart? A payment and reclaim system, such as along such as along the lines of the VAT return, so it would actually leave companies that they wouldn't be waiting longer for money. 
Thank, thank you very much. So uh, just uh, returning to the kind of question or the points I made a little earlier to one of your colleagues, what we're first of all looking to do is uh, obviously ensure that traders make the best choices they can to avail of the options to avoid uh, uh, tariffs through either the waiver scheme, the UK trader scheme, uh, claiming preference or using one of the uh, custom special procedures if, if they apply to them. But there will be circumstances uh, uh, where both where goods are moving through Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland where, where, where tariffs should be paid or where uh, goods are ultimately consumed in Northern Ireland uh, where uh, we, we are looking to provide a, a reimbursement scheme for traders in those circumstances. We're looking to get it in place as quickly as possible and when it is in place uh, traders will be able to make retrospective claims back to the beginning of the regime to ensure that they, they don't lose out from that perspective. Uh, clearly, there is uh, conscious that there will be some uh, potentially cash flow issues here. So we want to make sure we work as closely as possible with all the relevant uh, groups uh, to to make sure that we can uh, ease that as much as possible. And I think what I would welcome was if there's any particular individual cases that uh, you you you're, you come across, please uh, contact ESS or contact HMRC, and we'll we'll see what we can do to kind of uh, ease the burden as much as possible and uh, work with them on that. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, can we bring Sinead McLaughlin into the spotlight, please? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the presentation so far. And firstly, can I acknowledge uh, the work of TSS? The service is obviously in its infancy, and um, it's an evolving service, as we've heard uh, from the presenters this morning. Uh, and I think collectively what we all want to do is to make sure that we overcome any problems that uh, currently exist and smooth them out. Uh, and I'm um, also very well aware that TSS is an operational body, but it is also an important advisory body um, because it's at the coal face of where problems exist. And can I ask just... Um, what is the relationship and how do you feed into, for example, the joint uh, committee, the joint working group, in order that um, they are aware of, of the actual practicalities uh, uh, and the problems that are that are, exist in the system? Uh, and we've heard Christian indicate that um, it's an evolving uh, service. Um, and can he uh, maybe advise what current easements are under consideration at the moment, uh, what we can look forward to uh, in making uh, the service much more user-friendly uh, from, from the perspective of the businesses and the hauliers, et cetera, that are affected uh, by the service. And can I also say uh, that um, we, nobody wanted the protocol at all. Nobody wanted uh, Brexit uh, in its current form, um, but we are where we are because of Brexit, not the protocol. And so just what additional easements are being explored uh, and where we think that we can overcome it. We've all, we've heard about the easements or the, the improvements in the actual digital and, and the platform itself, but over and above that, what is it? Okay, that, that, thank you for your question. So, so um, and, 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 for, and, and yes, it, it is uh, an evolving service, as we said. Um, we, because we are talking to, to so many traders, because we are at the coal face, as, as you say, uh, because we, we are taking so many calls and we're making those outbound calls as well, uh, then yes, we, we're in a, a unique position of, of being able to take that feedback uh, from traders on, on simplifications that they think uh, would be useful, uh, improvements to the service, uh, and all of that feedback is is gathered, uh, and it is uh, grouped and consolidated, and, and we discuss this on a, a very regular basis. So, as I said, the the um, the individual calls that we have, the the the, the um, collaboration that goes on within the call centre, especially between three agents, um, our expert advisors, and the tier two agents, enables us to gather that feedback, and then. And then what we do is, is we make recommendations back to uh, HMRC. Uh, so Mary mentioned the, uh, the product backlog, so uh, enhancements that can be made to improve and simplify the service are fed into that product backlog and, and prioritised with, with HMRC. Um, so so the, the, the modifications or improvements that, that, that would have uh, the maximum impact. Um, 
but also uh, we feed back to HMRC in terms of uh, other simplifications or easements that, that, that may, may be useful uh, and may be worthwhile. Uh, and through HMRC, then that there is a route up to the Joint Committee and, and other departments um, as, as well. Uh, and a, a specifically to the particular easements that are being planned. Uh, that's, that's very much, uh, a, very much a HMRC uh, a, a government function uh, to, to look at that sort of things. All I can say is as soon as we become aware of them within TSS, obviously we work to modify the system and process as quickly as possible to enable those to be reflected in, in our service. Uh, but perhaps, Aidan, you, you want to talk about the uh, easements. Uh Thank you, Christian. I think there's a, a lot to add to what you've said. Uh, basically, we're we're alive to the, the kind of need to kind of explore as far as possible uh, ways in which we can uh, uh, make things as straightforward and, and simple as possible for business, and particularly around uh, data requirements. And we're we're uh, we're exploring as far as possible ways in which we can we can reduce the data requirements uh, as far as possible in the supplementary declarations, and working very closely with TSS on on how we can uh, deliver that. Yeah, and going back to the point I made earlier around targeting traders to the right options uh, in respect of uh, of tariffs, we're, we're trying to make sure that we're, as we release the kind of the the supplementary declarations to traders, that we kind of do it in a way that we we can uh, target those traders uh, with the right options uh, and make sure the call centre staff are ready to kind of do, uh, to work with those traders on on the on those correct options to make sure we can. We can ease them through the process and ensure that they're not paying tariffs where they're, where they're not due. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Michelle. Andrew Muir. Can we bring Andrew into the spotlight? Thank you very much, Chair, and um, uh, thank you for coming here this morning. Um, very unusual, very large committee meeting uh, this morning. Uh, just following on and from the question from Rosemary Barton in terms of the at-risk goods and the, the rebate process, obviously that's a, a significant issue. Um, if, whether there's any timescales for resolution in relation to that, because obviously that has an impact upon cash flow, upon businesses. And just one other issue is just uh, in the Republic of Ireland, obviously they have their import system and whether you have learned any lessons from their experience to date. Obviously they don't have grace periods and stuff like that down south, and whether there's any learnings taken from what, what their experience has been to date. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so on the, the rebate scheme, as, as I say, what we're trying to make sure is that we can uh, ensure that uh, traders avoid tariffs in the first place as far as possible. But where uh, they, they do incur tariffs uh, and those goods are ultimately consumed in Northern Ireland or re-exported and they could claim a rebate, we're looking to get the rebate scheme in place as quickly as possible. And uh, you know, and hopefully in the in the very uh, not too distant future, it will be in place. But in the, in the next few months, uh, and ensure that can traders can claim uh, re uh, rebates back to the beginning of the regime when that occurs. Uh, but you know, I think the, the key point to make is we're trying to make sure that we can target the various options of avoiding tariffs at traders. And if there are particular situations where traders are going to need to avail themselves of the rebate scheme, I think if they can contact. HMRC and TSS, and we'll try and work with them as, uh, as much as possible to try and uh, ensure that they don't uh, suffer uh, cash flow issues in, in that respect. Uh, on the second point around uh, learning from what's happened uh, in, in the South, we've, we, we do kind of speak to uh, our counterparts in the Irish Revenue on a regular basis to understand how things are operating there. Uh, Christian mentioned a uh, conversation TSS have had in that space, and quite a lot of that's around ensuring we can ease the flow of indirect movements from Northern Ireland through Ireland into the GB and beyond in both directions. And so we are very keen and acutely uh, aware of the need to ensure that the processes, uh, the Irish processes work uh, efficiently and smoothly as well to ensure that kind of Northern Ireland businesses can move their, their goods in that route in a, um, and as an unfettered a manner as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Philip? John Blair. Can we bring John Blair into the spotlight, please? Chair, sure, thank you. And can, can I uh, add my thanks uh, to those previously given to all of those here today, answering questions and looking at solutions. Um, and on the basis of solutions to the uh, much predicted problems of, of Brexit outworkings, 
can I try to focus on a potential goods in transit system? And I say that in relation to goods destined for Northern Ireland, coming from GB through the ports of Rosslare or Dublin. And mindful also that those routes are all, uh, often a more cost effective and certainly environmentally better way um, for departures in GB south of Birmingham. Can I ask, therefore, if uh, a goods in transit system can be achieved and if it is established, what impact it would have on current established arrangements and also tariff arrangements? To, some, to, to an extent, within TSS, we have implemented solutions for goods in transit and goods coming from GB into Northern Ireland via IE. Um, there, is, there are systems and support in place already within TSS, but again, they are evolving. Um, I, I am aware of an, a, a release, another, a further release on those transit journeys uh, that's imminent. I can't remember precisely which aspects are, are about to be released, but I know we have done uh, a, 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 a great deal of work on um, uh, providing support and systems for the transit. Um, the uh, One of the quotes I think that Rick Christian referred to was uh, around um, what we've done in the transit arena. Um, but as you rightly say, things um, are evolving and things are changing uh, and we will have more and more work to do, no doubt, to actually make uh, the transit journeys as easy as possible. But there is support there at this moment in time. And it's, it, it's worth pointing out, Mary, as well, that is dedicated support, isn't it? So, so, so we have a, a dedicated ring fence team of agents uh, who deal only uh, with those uh, transit inquiries and transit arrangements and providing support to traders wishing to use that route. And it's just cl it's clear to be clear, T TSS does provide a transit solution for the for the GB uh, to Northern Ireland via Ireland uh, uh, business that's up and running and, and businesses are using it at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Can we bring John Stewart into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, folks, for your answers thus far. It's been um, very helpful. Just to say from the outline, at the outset, I think the protocol is adding barriers and friction to trade, particularly east-west, and that's only going to increase costs and ultimately will be for Northern Ireland. Um, that being said, I do wish that all government departments and other organisations were as willing to embrace feedback and change as you have been so far. I know that many of the issues that have been raised initially have been worked to be at least overcome or recognised. Um, one problem keeps coming up from a couple of companies in my constituency is that of um, goods originating in GB and EU being only able to benefit from one preferential rate for inter-country movements. For example, a Polish company makes a product, it's bought by a GB company, but then if it's sold on the Northern Ireland, a tariff is applied, or if it's sold on to any other UK company, that would not be the case. Is that still the case? And is there anything being done to overcome that? And what work is being done with GB suppliers who have just to date not been willing to engage and are actually excluding the Northern Ireland market now for fear of the bureaucratic nature of this? Thank you. I, I'll take the first half of the question. For sure. That's all right. um, so the, uh, I think what you're describing is a, a peculiar or a feature of how the, 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 the kind of rules of origin work under the trade agreement with the, with the EU. Uh, what is available is if the uh, is something called return goods relief. So when the goods uh, come, move from say somewhere in the EU into GB are in free circulation and then move uh, into Northern Ireland, uh, like obviously those traders could use the UK trader scheme if those goods are staying in Northern Ireland. But if the if the goods uh, could move on to a uh, republic or elsewhere, uh, then there is uh, there is the return goods relief option. Uh, available, which means that you you can uh, you can kind of get relief against those tariffs, and I think uh, Trader Support Service will be uh, supporting traders in that going forward. And there is guidance from HMRC on how that operates. But we're very happy uh, to kind of uh, speak to any particular uh, 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 customers or just constituents uh, of yours uh, to kind of talk them through the process. If that would be helpful. Um, on the second point around uh, uh, GB trade uh, kind of suppliers to Northern Ireland, we, uh, as Christian and Mary have said, there's there, uh, there's quite a lot of outreach work 
to the GB uh, supplier uh, network who registered with Trade Support Service. More widely than that, HMRC is targeting kind of GB suppliers uh, as, as far as possible to ensure that they're a aware of uh, what the protocol requires, but be aware of the actual uh, kind of uh, help and support available with those movements through TSS and otherwise, and to ensure that they, they, they make the right choices in that respect. So we are doing as much as we, we can to kind of uh, identify and uh, communicate with and, and target those businesses to, to so they, they realise uh, how straightforward the process can be when you when you actually kind of utilise trade support service, etc. Thank you. I think it's also worth pointing out, Aidan, that the, the, the ongoing engagement we have with the different trade bodies that, that I pointed out earlier, uh, that, that those trade bodies are being um, very, very helpful and very supportive, and we're seeing very positive feedback from those trade bodies. So encouraging those trade bodies as well to reach out to their members uh, and, and, and to spread the word uh, that the TSS uh, is working um, and is, is simple to use. Thank you. Michelle. Dolores Kelly. Can we bring Dolores in? Thank you. Sorry. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much uh, for the presentation. And uh, like others, I want to join in uh, thanking TSS and others for working alongside operators in what has been a very uh, difficult uh, uh, time for everyone uh, following uh, the decision uh, of Brexit. But can I just ask, uh, in, in relation to um, any specialist goods or specialisms advice, whether that's available so that you're not going to the one source, but there's a range of, of, of experts uh, that can be reached by operators readily. Our, our uh, system of, of, of uh, support uh, across the uh, TSS uh, consortium is, um, I think, Chris, you mentioned earlier, we've tier one people who do simple things, tier two um, tend to be people with some customs experience who answer slightly more detailed queries. But it's probably our tier three agents that you're uh, referring to specifically. And, and in fact, our range of senior advisors um, who uh, uh, do a lot of the engagement with individual organizations or through with the trade associations. Uh, in recent times, um, we have aligned those tier three agents uh, with specific areas of specialism or sectors, if you like. Um, and those are the people um, that you know can best serve uh, a particular part of an organ or a particular sector within uh, the business community. So I think it's those agents that that need to be um, uh, aligned to some of the the, the queries that you you, you refer to. And um, so I think in 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 approaching TSS, if we make it clear that it is a very specific um, sector related, we can make sure that those queries are are direct. To the, the the right part of our organisation, but we are aligning people more and more to sectors and specialisms. Okay. Thank you. Claire Bailey. Can we bring Claire Bailey into the spotlight, please? Hello. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, and thanks. And some are recording their views. I think that uh, we can all really agree that Brexit has been the predicted disaster for Northern Ireland, causing deep problems and certainly with a lack of preparedness there as well. But following on from the questions already asked on goods and transit, um, I think uh, the Irish customs declaration systems can be done online and edited up to the point of travel for ease of use for traders. And I just wanted to ask, first, if that's right, and if so, are HMRC looking at ways to adapt their systems to something similar? Um, and also note that HMRC has recently told a House of Commons committee that a solution had been found to an issue that could have seen the NI steel importers facing a 25% tariff. Um, and that would mean that then importers can access a quota and not have to pay the EU safeguard charge. So can you tell us if this solution has worked and has it been successful? And can something similar be applied to other sectors? So, so let me let me take the, the last uh, question first. Uh, so uh, yes, we've been working very closely with the kind of uh, business representative organisations in Northern Ireland, particular manufacturing uh, NI, uh, working with their their kind of uh, the, their businesses to kind of find solutions to this the, the steel issue. 
uh, and there was a, a measure in the uh, finance uh, bill setting out that uh, kind of rest of the world steel importers can access the in quota rate where where the where the GB uh, or UK quota and the EU quotas are open, and that has been availed of uh, by uh, kind of by traders, and equally on the, the GB to Northern Ireland route. Uh, there is uh, traders can uh, access uh, a kind of in quota rate as well on, on movements in that direction. In other words, not be uh, subject to a tariff where those quotas are open. And that has been working well and operating well. Uh, we are aware that there are other sectors uh, where there are kind of issues with uh, trade defence measures, etc. And we're, we're continuing to work very closely with the industry to understand the issues and work with them to kind of develop solutions. Um, on the other question of, in respect of the uh, uh, declaration service, uh, the, the HMRC systems, the goods vehicle movement system and, uh, and kind of customs declaration service are uh, uh, modern and flexible systems that allow traders a, to pre-lodge but also to amend uh, their, kind of, their, their processes up to the point at which they, they, kind of, they, they move the goods. Uh, so it is a it, it works in a in a similar way as I think you're describing the Irish system, which I'm I'm less close to, uh, obviously. Uh, and the points that were made earlier by uh, Christian and Mary with respect to a uh, groupage solution also helps in that respect. In that, uh, uh, kind of traders can uh, make changes uh, right up to the, the point at which they're 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 entering the goods into the uh, into the. Uh, uh, the system for uh, the goods vehicle movement system, so that that allows that allows flexibility in that respect as well. Thank you. Thank you. And we bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight, please. Uh, hello, Chair, and thank you to everyone for their presentation this morning. Earlier this month, we seen the British government taking unilateral action in regards to the protocol and move. Uh, change dates back to October. Now, uh, I, I think we are seeing a situation where the protocol is being used in the negotiations between the British government and the EU around what's happening in Dover, more to do than what's happening in Belfast or Lorn. And there have been concerns raised that HMRC won't be in a position to move forward with a customs declaration service uh, in October. Uh, can you offer any reassurances that that's not the case and that HMRC is being properly resourced and driven to ensure that customs declaration service will be in place by October? Thank, thank you. I'll, I'll come in on this one. Uh, the customs declaration system is, is already a life system. It is in place. It has been in place uh, for a period of time and was in place for Northern Ireland from the end of the year. And, and trade support service links into the custom declaration service. I think what you're, uh, the point you're, you're referring to is in respect to parcel movements uh, up to October. And uh, obviously, as I said earlier, we are kind of looking in particular on the business consumer side to get some uh, pragmatic and proportionate solutions uh, to, to uh, those issues. Uh, but the customs declaration service will it be scaled to ensure that it can uh, meet whatever the requirements are with respect to declaration numbers, and uh, we're confident of that. Thank you. Thank you. Liz Kimmons. Can we bring Liz into the spotlight, please? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to everyone for the presentation this morning. My my question, just two questions that kind of are linked back to what Stuart Dixon had uh, talked about in terms of staff and service demand. Um, there was an assertion that the, the TSS is under-resourced. However, to my knowledge, there's 36,000 registered traders and 1,000 staff. So theoretically, for each staff member, there are 36 companies um, being advised. Um, and I know, uh, Mary, you had mentioned that at the minute, you are, you are, you know, you are capable of, of delivering the service. Um, and I would assume that not all of these companies would require daily advice. And with calls being answered so promptly, within six seconds on average, it appears that demand for the service wouldn't be very, very high. Um, I just have some concerns considering that there's £355 million set aside for the scheme over two years. It's a monumental uh, amount of money. And it was just around paying value for money on that. If, if, if we could get a comment on that or, or maybe some clarity around some of that. Well, uh, the value for money uh, judgment, I suppose, I, I need to leave to, to, to HMRC colleagues. But in terms of, of what we're doing, 
we we um we have moved successfully to date 337 uh, consignments into Northern Ireland. We do have those thousand people, but the thousand people aren't necessarily aligned in the, in the in the I suppose simple maths way that it's it's one person to to, to, to 36 uh, com companies. That, that that's not quite how we operate. We have a a, a range of how we're organised in terms of we have stakeholder engagement teams, which are uh, doing that uh, outreach, those seminars that we described with trade organisations, the one to one advice with various um, uh, customer organisations where we actually have that one to one engagement and describe exactly how they would through the system so that's our stakeholder engagement team we have technical teams that look after the actual platforms we have a contact center that um you know have 750 agents some of those are dedicated to exports some of those are dedicated to transit as we described earlier and then we have the tiered system for either the inbound or the outbound calls um, but as we say a lot of what is being done is a digital solution uh, and the technical and and business process teams, if you like, are engaged in deploying that solution both from a technology and the business process point of view. So the, the, the people that are engaged on this are across a broad range of, of roles and duties. So um, we, we probably have never thought of it in the terms of one one person looks after 36 companies. That, that That's not actually how we operate. Uh, and if you think uh, we've alluded to the doc to the material that we've produced, we've alluded to uh, the knowledge articles that need to be produced for our customers. We produce a weekly um, uh, bulletin advising traders about what the new releases are, what changes are even coming to HMRC systems that will affect them in the overall process, uh, and any policy uh, decisions and so on that are made. So there's a huge amount of effort goes into developing that kind of material. So from, from an overall value for money point of view, um, I can assure you that those people are working exceptionally long hours. I would also say they're incredibly proud of what they've achieved in the very short time scale that they've achieved it in. Um, so, uh, but the overall value for money is, is not my judgment to make, but um, I can assure you that those people are um, working every hour that's been sent to them so far. Thank you. Thanks, Can we bring Morris into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Yep, we can. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you, Christian, and your team for your presence and your presentation this morning. Uh, I would like to add to the comments of others about my opposition to the protocol. Uh, as an unnecessary burden on Northern Ireland traders with their single largest market in the inland. But uh, one of the, the, the major concerns that we hear as MLAs uh, relates to the delays in the delivery of plants, trees and seeds due to the need for uh, phytosanitary certificates and numerous checks by authorities. Now, any delays can result in serious damage to the viability of these products, damage to the plants. So what plans are in place to mitigate the risk to the quality of these goods that time delays in transport can cause. Um, so, uh, TSS, TSS has been set up to, to facilitate uh, the movement of goods uh, specifically as uh, customs processes. Uh, so, so, when it comes to SPS certificates, um, although we provide advice and guidance wherever we can uh, actually it's not within the tss scope of responsibility to to you know, create those certificates and, and, and to make that happen uh, but uh, as i said earlier we we do work very closely with defra uh, and dera um, i mentioned uh, earlier the 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 example of uh, groupage uh, fish uh, where we we we, where we did work very hard with, with DEFRA and DERA to, to ensure that fish could be moved uh, over the New Year's period. So wherever possible, we will help. We will try and help to coordinate whatever needs to happen, both for uh, individual traders um, at, at, and also to ease the overall process. Uh, but, but actually, uh, SPS certificates and, uh, and, and that, that side of things actually lies beyond the scope of the TSS service. 
Okay, thank you. Um, if I could just ask a question around um, some concerns have been raised about the need for consignment level um, declarations for business to consumer packages um, and what that might mean for, for people and for businesses. So I was just wondering if any consideration has been given to, the, for example, um, Balkan procedures to be an option in respect of that. Thanks. I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, so, uh, as you're aware, the the, uh, the government has announced the kind of uh, for six month uh, easement period in respect to business and consumer parcels, and what the government is looking for is a uh, proportionate and pragmatic solutions to this to, to ensure that the, uh, it protects the kind of consumer, ordinary consumer, and doesn't add uh, excessive burden. So, we're looking for it to work with the uh, uh, commission on getting solutions that are. Uh, are sensible and proportionate, and uh, in that context, uh, clearly issues like those you've described are the sort of things that we would we want to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Robert Dolores and Les. Any further questions? Harry Harvey. Harry Harvey, can we bring Harry into the spotlight, please? Okay, that's me off and good now. Okay. Okay, well, first of all, I'll start out saying protocol um, is not necessary. I don't agree with it or want it, but moving on, I'd say that um, the service provided by ourselves and TSS is only to be praised. You've been invaluable at keeping the weeds turning. You can give guidance in minutes that could usually take hours or days, um, that could take a week. Uh, I must say we appreciate your help you provide all and small businesses alike. I would like to direct a question to HMRC if that's okay. And it's on the second hand margin scheme. Okay. Um, and the import and the impact that this can have on local traders and consumers, especially with regards to used motor vehicles. Okay. So I'm just wondering, can HMRC provide an update on this derogation from EU VAT rules? And maybe if you have time, if you could tell me what other sectors were affected by the second-hand margin scheme. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're, we're working with the, uh, the Commission to kind of uh, look to agree a derogation in respect of uh, the uh, second-hand margin scheme. And in the interim, Government issued guidance to traders on how they can continue to apply the margin scheme in relation to motor vehicles sold since the end of the transition period. Uh, and we can send you a link to the full guidance on that if that, if that, is, uh, if that is helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I, I have, uh, I suppose, maybe a final question. Um, as, as we kind of move forward and um, the British government is entering into to new trade agreements um, with, with other countries. Has there been any, I suppose, assessment of the need for increased um, diligence around those uh, the trade then that would come from Britain into the north, um, to you know, uh, in terms of goods at risk and the potential for um, things to move into the to the EU single market? So I'll take that question. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the beginning of it. My my my, uh, my IT was playing up a bit. Can you just repeat the question, please? Yeah, no problem. Um, I was just saying, in relation to, I suppose, moving into the the slightly longer term, as the British government moves towards finalising new trade agreements with other countries, will there has there been any assessment about the need for, I suppose, to increase diligence around the trade between Britain and the North, with the potential for goods to move into the the EU single market? Thank you. The, the UK trade scheme uh, is, has been set up uh, as a scheme to kind of provide uh, the, the necessary uh, kind of checks uh, in respect of whether uh, those traders are ones who can claim the goods are not at risk and that those goods are staying in Northern Ireland. And so, therefore, we are, we are making sure that in the process for applying for the scheme uh, that we put in place the right kind of uh, assurances that those traders are ones who can, who can demonstrate that those goods are staying in Northern Ireland, and that's the kind of approach we're taking uh, across the piece. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Cahill Boylan has his hand up, Michelle. So we'll, we'll bring Cahill back in. Chair, thanks very much. And Chair, thanks for uh, chairing the meeting. I mean, there's a lot of people in and a lot of questions were asked earlier on. 
but but just aiding to yourself and Christian, maybe I mean just some clarity because I mean at, at the start there was concerns about the poor level of uptake in terms of registration and uh, to the scheme. You said you predicted there was thirty. You, your your predictions were twenty four thousand. Now there's thirty six. I mean, just for clarity, and maybe you'd like to write to, to the committees just to give us the information. I mean, where's where was that database? You said the HMRC database. Where where exactly did you get that data from? And I know we've asked the question and other members about the potential figures. I mean, clearly. Um, I would just like to see where we got that data and the potential moving forward, just so we can have that place. Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we can't provide you with, uh, with the basis on that. It's fair to say that uh, there was less data, obviously, on movements GB to NI before, so there was uh, limited data sources, but we've, uh, we, we kind of, within that, we, we came up with figures that were the best estimates, but we, were, we can provide you the basis on which we, we came up with that. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. Are we any more? Um, can we bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and Ian, if I can just go back to um, sorry, Ian, if I can just go back to the, the, the point I was making to you in my previous question in relation to customs declaration service and the uplift that we required in terms of parcels, etc. I think you said at the end of your answer to me that you were confident that the service would be at the level required by October. Uh, is, is that the case? And if that is the case, I don't expect you to answer this question, though you may have to be honest. If that is the case, that would suggest that there will be no further requirement for any unilateral action by the British government in relation to pushing back deadlines. Thank you. And to, to be clear, the, the, the kind of key driver for the, the, the easements in respect of a uh, kind of parcel movements is to ensure that kind of uh, kind of suppliers and fast parcel operators are uh, are ready to kind of uh, comply with the requirements and those requirements are sensible and proportionate. Uh, what I'm saying, just in respect to the customs declaration services, we we're confident that it has it is scaled to the capacity to meet the uh, any declaration requirements both in uh, in Northern Ireland, but obviously in due course, customs declaration service is going to be the the system the service uh, for uh, GB traders as well. So we're looking to scale it uh, kind of significantly across the piece. Thanks. Okay. Do you, either of you have any additional questions? No? Thank you very much. Um, so just to say thank you, Christian, Aidan, Mary and Julie for um, being with us this morning. It has been a very useful briefing for all members. Um, and just to highlight to members that any additional questions or issues arising from this session for follow-up will be taken forward by the economy committee team and so if anybody has anything if they want to forward that to the, the committee email address so um just thank you again very much for being with us it has been very useful and just um the just to advise members that we will be seeking a uh, members agreement for the minutes of this meeting to be agreed by the three committees um is that okay for the three committee chairs okay um, again, just to thank all members for taking part in this morning's meeting and also to both Michelle and to Philip for their assistance and to the committee teams for the efforts that they have put into to getting it um, set up for us. So um, thank you very much. I just chair before we go, Mary has her hand up there. Okay. Um, Mary, are you wanting to come in? Sorry. Sorry, can I just say one thing? I mean, I think uh, as a consortium uh, here, we're, we very much appreciate that uh, you have many concerns, many questions about what has happened, um, or what is happening and how we're, we're proceeding. But given your comments today, we very much appreciate that you're acknowledging uh, what we have done to date. And I think that's a great message for us to be able to bring back to our team. So thank you very much for that appreciation that each of you have expressed. Thank you. Okay, so then just moving on, item number three on the agenda is any other business and none has been indicated, so unless there is, thank you. And then item number four is just to end this morning's meeting, so thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.